welcome back everybody if you've been away so we're moving on to the next uh exercise of adding new attributes so the the problem here is um what to do with um how to get rid of things like not a number so i'm looking at uh w5 psc and i'm using the table viewer for this one and if you look at this is jmag and there are two columns here jmag and hmag um we're looking at the jmag column and there are things where it says not a number nan now that's fine that's okay that happens in real data there are there are duff values and you've got to put something in uh the problem is if you try and do a maths operation um that uh if you have a maths operation nan value in it um it's going to it's going to crash so let's assume that we wanted to deal with the magnitudes um I wanted to normalize the values of the magnitudes as you would in a database, but it, as, as you would say in Excel or something. But I want to do it in a way that excludes these not a numbers. So what I've got is um, to go to the problem. You've got a whole table of values here. And I'm going to add a new column to the table that is the JMAG normalized and I want to do it without hitting these NANs. Incidentally, uh, good computing practice is not to store in a, in a table derived data. So if you're, when, you, when you receive your data, it'll, it won't be normalized typically. It'll just come off a machine or a measuring instrument. It is the, 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 the good practice is to calculate the normalized data or whatever when you need it rather than store a normalized version in your table because if you later update the table and add more values to your table then you've got to recalculate your normalized so the, it's, it's considered good computational practice not to store derived attributes um, if you have a table of peoples, of people, and you have their date of birth, you don't have a column called age because you have to update. You have to update the column age every day because of birthdays. You just store the the date of birth and calculate the age as you need it. So, what we're going to do here is try and create normalized versions of this uh, JMAG attribute. I'm, I'm not sure whether that's the real magnitude or the apparent magnitude. Um, astronomers have different. One, one is the, the, the how bright the star appears. The other is how bright it actually is, allowing for how far away it is. I'm sorry, I can't tell you which of those two JMAG is. So um, we have to go to the arithmetic attributes here and it's data set psc and we need a new arithmetic attribute so we've got to give it a name um we type j norm there right so what are the attributes it's based on jmag Okay, so we insert JMAG. Right, now it always appears in this curly brace format, which is to do with the fact that internally all the data is stored in these things called Python dictionaries. And what we've got to do is um, normalize it so 
it's just going we're going to use we've got to find the maximum minima of this of jmag and to do that we're going to use numpy uh, which is the mathematics package available in python but we've got to allow for the fact that there are these not a numbers so if we if we run the ordinary max and min on this on jmag it will crash because it will fail because of the, the not a numbers so we've got to get rid of the not a numbers so we're going to use numpy has got something for that it's called an nan max and min so um we'll show that np numpy appears as mp um the function is n a n max and now we copy thing in here so that's how you would find the maximum of the list and we need to we're normalizing the list so we take away the minimum NAN min. Pop JMAG in again. Um, it's saying here down at the bottom that you have a valid expression. Uh, if I do something stupid like unbalance the brackets, it can, says incomplete or invalid syntax. So it's stopping you entering something that is not valid uh, Python code. Um, this doesn't check that you're doing what you think you're doing. You could have made a horrible logical error here. It's only syntax errors it catches. Click OK. We've got it, the expression's here. Click OK again. Go back to here. And there it is, there's our J norm expression. It's appeared there. Let me do that. Um, and you can see that where J mag is not a number, J norm is not a number, it's carried it through. Um, so I'll give you a minute or two to have a go at trying that on your own. Oh, and if you want to um, break the rule I just told you about not saving data with derived fields in it, you can, of course, now save this, um, save W5PSC as uh, comma separated values, and it will include the J norm in there if, if you feel you need have the need to do that. Um, the only one I know of is numpy i suspect that scipy is probably imported but i'm not sure um you'd have to check the documentation for that right okay i'm going to stop sharing close gloovies and start it up again for the next exercise which uses a different data set um it can handle multiple data sets, but you know, it might slow down a bit. So we're back to sharing Gloovis again. Um, and we import some fresh data. And this time it's earthquakes underscore 2010 raw comma separated value. So this one will take a little while to to load because again it's it's quite a big comma separated value file. So there's a lot of text to be processed. So we have the earthquake data. And we can drag it in here. And this time we select 3D scatter.
and we get something that looks a bit strange like that. Right, so this is showing you in longitude and latitude. You can, if I turn it around, you can drag and you can drag to rotate these things. You can kind of see some sort of weird plate tectonics there. Um, I've already added three dependent columns to this called X, Y, and Z. So if we use the plot options here, set the X axis to X, the Y axis to Y, and the Z axis to Z, you now should see a sphere. Um, and roughly you're seeing the uh, tectonic plate boundaries, which is where most of the earthquakes occur. Um, you can scale things up. Um, the stretching controls here will allow you to stretch individual axes if you want to make, an, make your sphere bigger or turn it into a spheroid or ellipsoid. So I'll just give you a little while to get that up. Okay, so we go over here to plot layers and uh, we'll play with some of this. So we've got size for the points. Um, we could try linear, which is just making them look fairly gross. Go back to fixed. We can change the size, make them smaller or larger. If we go to linear, you can now scale how much. Ah, I know what I've done, time. You should have ch changed that to magnitude. So now we're scaling the size of the points according to the magnitude of the earthquake. So that lets you see. Um, if you combine that, you can see that you get a lot of high, a lot of earthquakes, a lot of big earthquakes in certain locations around the Pacific. Uh, color, again, we can do. So now we're changing. We've got a color scale in. We're changing the color according to the magnitude of the earthquakes. Oh, sorry, the time. I should change that to magnitude. So now you, as well as the size being changed by the magnitude, we can change the color. Um, and you've got the option of other color scales should you want them. So you can make your plot look quite pretty that way. We're about to go into the coding section of this. So I'm going to stop sharing there and just give you a little, a few slides on. Right, so the basics of programming, you assign values to variables and you can have um, lists and the lists don't all have to contain the same type of data. So you can have a list with a variable like seven and a string in it. You can you can add to a list either by stating what should be at a point in that list, what should be at a given index, or you can use the append function. Right, so these are the dictionaries that I mentioned earlier. The dictionary works like this. It's in curly brackets, and the entries are separated by commas. And internally, there is a thing with a full colon in it. Everything to the left of the colon is the key Everything to the right is the data. So it's essentially a list which has blue and nine as the keys and has seven and data as the values. You can add to such a thing by going X, uh, 78 equals high, and now it's got 78 maps to high. This is, these dictionaries are 
are basically how Python works, um, how Bluvis works internally. If you think about it with the strange erratic heterogeneous data it's designed to work with, there's no real other option. Um, dictionaries are also how essentially Python works internally. Um, objects in Python are basically implemented as dictionaries. Um, when you work in Python, um, everything comes down, everything that you, or everything you load goes into a thing called a data collection. And it, this will always be available if you program Python, if you work through the Python user interface, the terminal, which we're gonna do next. If, it, if you're working in a script, you have to create it and load data into it. Um, in order for this dictionary type thing to work, you've, you've got to get the keys. And so these are, these are if we, here we've created a data collection, we've loaded some, some um, we've loaded our star data into it. Um, you've got to get, to get that data. It appears within data collection as a list called data. And it's basically da data acquires things in the order in which you load them. So all I've done is loaded star data and it's in location zero in the array. So I can assign a variable to that called star catalog. And if I call, if I call components on it, I get a list of the various things. So pixel axis zero was the first thing in the star catalog. So that's the first thing in components. And I can then extract data by calling the appropriate component. So it's a roundabout thing. You can't just sort of go straight in there and say, I want column zero, I want column five. You've got to get the components and then say, I want component zero, which returns the, the heading for column zero, which then gets you column zero. Okay, three very useful commands in Python. Um, and these are very useful when you do interactive Python. Uh, firstly, the type x, the type of a variable, tells you what sort of variable you've got. So here, x is seven, type of seven, it tells you it's an int. Dir, this gives you a list of all the um, functions and uh, data that this object has, and everything in Python is an object if you're into object oriented programming. Um, and finally, help. This returns to you basically all the comment strings for the object. Uh, I had better show you that in a power tool window. So there are two ways of running Python uh, from the command line. You can either type Python which, which just runs a Python interpreter, or you can type IPython, which runs the interpreter, but it also gives you uh, things like commands, command tool commands like change directory and things. So we'll use that. Um, so this is just a straight IPython. Um, if I type LS, it lists all the directories and so forth fairly normal. Um, I'll just run you through what, we, what I was talking about there. So x equals seven, x, it's, it's a, in, if I type type of x, it tells me it's an integer. Um, if I type dir of x, it gives me this great long list of things that you can do with integers, the absolute value um, and so forth. Uh, for those of you who are a bit worried, um, these things that begin and end with double underscores are called dunder methods. Um, and they're called internally within Python uh, by other functions. So you shouldn't really need to worry about dunder methods too much. Um, so, <clears throat> repa, yeah, there's... Uh, String. So 
the Dunder method string str converts it to a string gives you the string but you're not really meant to do that you're meant to use so it, when you type the function str it goes and looks in here in all these dunder methods to see if you've got a string dunder method and then calls it that's the the idea of dunder methods it's for those of you who are interested it's connected to a thing called duck typing in python which comes from the, the phrase if it waddles like a duck if it walks like a duck and talks like a duck it's a duck um these these functions are typed so that if there's a if they look for a method in the data in, in the thing they're called on if that method exists they work if it doesn't they don't right so the final thing was help there we go help x and what this does is it produces all the um help uh comments that have been put into it into the functions by the original programmers so that can be very useful if you're programming right so that's enough basic python programming we can go back oh right okay screen share and stop fair enough uh, if we go back to Gloovis and share. So what we're interested in now are these things up here. And the one we're interested in is the terminal. So now you get what you've just been looking at, IPython. But now you're, you've got an IPython that's running inside Gloovis with your data available to it. Um, one way of seeing exactly what you've got is DIR and just don't, don't put anything in brackets there. It shows you what your environment is. So you've got all sorts of things here, get a how to, and you've got DC and data collection and DC is the thing you're looking for. Um, application, that is the actual graphical user interface that you're looking at. So, um, Let's do dir of DC. This should contain our data. And we get an amazingly complicated thing coming out here. Um, do not worry about this. You only need to worry about to get your data out of it. But I'll just point out, when you program for data for a graphical user interface, there's the whole issue that when the user clicks something in the user interface, you might have to update the data. If the data changes because new data has arrived over the network, it has to notify the user interface. So you end up with these very big, overcomplicated data structures that have got all the signaling for communicating with the user interface built into them and the ability to store the data. Um, if you've got six months of your life when you're not doing very much else, you can learn to use all this. Uh, the key thing is hub. Hub is where basically the signaling with the um, with the graphical user interface goes on. But we're just interested in the data. So we've done DC. Um, let's have a look at trying DC data. See what that produces. Okay, DC data has produced a list. It's got one item in it, and it's earthquakes raw. So we, we we're we're cooking here. Um, so uh, we'll make EQ data equal to DC data zero. I just type EQ data. Yeah, it's, it's my earthquake data. Um, we now need to get the columns from that.
and we get the components. And everyone with it's E N T S. Okay, so if I column, if I just type columns, I get all the columns. So the rest of this is to try and use um, this to create a new subset uh, programmatically. So having got the columns, um, let's get the magnitudes. So we have to go get components. We're now working on the component. We're now working on the data. We use and naught one, two, three, four, five. So it's going to be columns five. That should give us a list of magnitudes. Oops. I've misspelled something somewhere. Ah, it's not plural, it's singular. If I list mags, I'm going to get an enormous, yeah, it's a glue component. And mags is itself a data object. So to see the data, yeah, you have to call data. So even though you've gone into data and you've got the magnitude data, what you've got is a component which itself has a data field. This, this kind of dereferencing is, is something you're just going to have to live with. It's sort of inevitable when you try to make things flexible and user interfacey. Um, so the, the object is to get the large magnitude of earthquakes. That's create a subset of those. So the way to the, the approach to doing that is you create a selector, you, you set up the rule that will define your subset, and then you create the subset. So first I'll create the selector. Okay. So this time, instead of um, calling data or anything, or, or I've just I've put this thing ID in. Um, what that means is it's telling it, don't do anything with this data now. When it comes, when you need it later on, you're going to need the data in column five, but don't don't execute it now. Um, this is an example of something called lazy evaluation, which is popular in computer science. It's where you calculate things when you need them. So the rough, the rough idea is that if you were, say, doing something that involved the value of pi, you calculate it to three decimal places. If later on in the calculation you need it to six decimal places, you then calculate it to the next three decimal places and so on and so forth. Um, you, you, you just do as much work as you need to do to get the result you need at the present time. And later on, if you need more, you do more. Um, it's a pain to connect, to interact this with um, parallel processing, by the way. So we want the magnitudes which are greater than five so selector so selector is the earthquake data id columns five so find the magnitude data and 
the Boolean operation greater than five. So now um, you just have to create a subset. And just to be difficult, you can't create a subset on its own, you have to create a subset group. Is equal to, what is it equal to? A D C, go back to your data collection, U subset group. You've got to give it a name, big, and the selector. Right, so we've now created a new subset group. It probably hasn't, because of the lazy evaluation, it probably hasn't actually evaluated anything yet. Um, so it's also, itself a type of data, so it, it's, To find our data, we have to, um, so we have to call, it's got a thing called subsets, which is a list of the subsets it actually held, holds. And it's only got one because we only created one. So we have created a, a subset. We're happy there at least. So subset zero should be plural, got the plural. So subset zero is our subset big of earthquake data. And if you want to get a uh, field out of that, you can do X. And that gives you the X values. So um, that's how you get them. So have we, can we see our subset now? Um, If we shrink this down, yes, our subset has come up there. There's big, it appeared there. And there are the big, the earthquakes greater than magnitude five um, lit up in red. So as everything we've typed in here on the terminal has um, popped up here. So you can create these things programmatically through the terminal. It is a bit of a pain, I agree, that you have to work because the data is so um, separated, so abstracted because of the need to make it flexible for the um, graphical user interface. But it does let you actually use a program. Um, you, can, you can do more flexible ways of constructing subsets through a programmable interface than you can through all the buttons and things. So if I go to this, where I created the thing, data columns, um, yeah, here, um, in the part where I, I create, where I did the selector, um, this can be a function. So you could write your own selection function combining multiple columns and things. Um, if you see what I mean, which is, it's harder to do. I mean, if you think about it, how would you select, how would you create subsets across columns unless you can get all the columns into a scatter plot at the same time or things, or you have to go very painfully through histogram after histogram. Um, and it's, if you're gonna have, if you've got selections that involve if else, if magnitude is greater than five, use one selection rule. If magnitude is less than five, use a different selection rule. That's really, really, really difficult to do with, um, with, the, with the user interface, with the graphical user interface. You would add it to DC, and I've got an example. 
okay, you should be seeing a text editor, right? Uh, um, this is exactly how you, this is a script that does exactly how, so we're sort of jumping into the stuff in the next exercise. But here you have to import this thing called a data object. That would be available in that terminal anyway, because you're already in GlueViz. This is a script. You would use NumPy to create uh, two, a two variable array. So you, you've got to tell data the name. So it's going to be X and Y. Um, so you've now created, this is a, a GlueViz data object. X is these random numbers. Y is these random numbers. And then you, you create the data, you create a data collection with D or um, I forget what the exact command is, but there'd be something to, you could, you could add, if you've already got a data collection, you'd be able to do something like DC append D. So you can create data and add it to your data collection to DC that way. And you'd have to basically type this into um, the terminal that we were just using and then use DC. We'll go quickly back to Gluviz because there's one thing I should have shown you while we were at it. So on this, when you've done all this stuff, you might well want to save it. Um, you can select it all and save it to a text editor, but you can click on save as HTML. Um, so it, you can give it a file name there, save, um, I'll open it. So uh, I'll have to stain. And I will change to. So there, there's the stuff, all the stuff I've just printed in or typed in. The whole of my whole record is there as a HTML page. And you can, if you've worked something out in, in, uh, on the IPython terminal, you can save it uh, as this, and then you can cut and paste the bits that work into your program. So you can develop bits interactively that you cut and paste into a program later. This is, this is a viewer basically for the thing that, uh, for, for what we've just done with the earthquakes. Um, so I'll take you through it. We have to import data collection. We have to import the glue application itself. That's going to be the glue and scatter viewer because that's for a 2D scatter. And we have to import this thing load data. So step one, we create a data collection. And step two, we append to the data collection, the load earthquake. So we call the load data function with the, the file name that we want to load. Um, and this is, this is how you'd have appended uh, the random number arrays that we were talking about a couple of minutes ago. So as before we get, we find data zero, uh, as before we get the columns, as before we get the columns, um, column five is greater than, as before we create a subset group, and then um, I, I say that in the subset group style, the color should be red. Um, the colors here are those of matplotlib. So any color codes that you know about that work in matplotlib, you can use here. Um, you now have to create a glue application. That's basically the, the window, the whole, the glue main window. In the scatter, the, when you create the glue application, it will automatically pick up the data collection. So you don't have to worry about, oh yeah, it gets the data collection here. So it's automatically included because you, you've given it to it when it created. So it's got the data collection. It's got the subset group. Um, although you gave subset group a name when you created it, data collection also stores it internally. So that you, you don't have to pass in the subset group separately. 
Um, and then you create a scatter viewer, set the ID, um, add to the scatter viewer the, the earthquake data. Then you have to say what the X and the Y are. And for this time, I'm doing longitude and latitude. And then you just start, you, you start Kluvis. So um, I'm in, I've got my command tool in that window. Um, command is Python. Um, earthquake viewer it goes away. And it takes a little while and hopefully if all goes well in a minute or two, it will pop up for me Gloovis. Okay, you can now see what it's popped up. Um, it's given me the 2D scatter plot with, I got, I've got the sub root, I've got the sub, sub routine. I've got the subset big and it's in red on the scatter plot. And I can obviously just drag and drop to create the sphere and everything else. I didn't show you the sphere because the sphere is on a thing called a plugin, which is not sort of part normally, which is an extra part of Blue Visit. It's been added in later and it's a bit more complicated to get that to show up and it's not very well documented, but this is the easy way of doing it. Once it's up, you can, you can then create a, a, um, a 3D scatter through this, through the, uh, through the ordinary interface. Um, Oh, I created a 2D scatter. But anyway, you can use all the tools now that we've been doing earlier on. There is an exercise there to see if you can try and uh, add your own, uh, a second 2D scatter. I'll, I'll leave you to do that in your own time and just show you the last part, which is um, how you add functions to Gloovis. So the object here is to add a function. So the aim is to sort of simply add a function to the linking data, the link data part. So if I select these two we used before, so they both appeared. If I go to link data here, um, you just pick anything. Uh, create advanced link. There are some functions here that the function we used before was identity by default. There's also a function that converts lengths to volumes. Uh, and then of course, being an astronomical in origin, there's a lot of functions for converting between different astronomical data types. So let's assume for some art reason, we've got uh, data in Celsius and Fahrenheit. How would we fix that? Because we don't have a function for Celsius to Fahrenheit. So to do that, we close down glue. So we have a file in that in that we've been given called demo config. And inside that, there is a Celsius to Fahrenheit conversion and a Fahrenheit to Celsius conversion. And we've got to get those into Gluvis somehow. So the first thing you've got to do is import from glue config the link, this thing, link function. Now, link function is what is called a decorator. Um, and what it does is it's a function that takes another function as its input and returns a modified version of that function that fits in with the type system of some other package. And if that doesn't make a lot of sense to you, don't worry. Um, the link function has two things, info Celsius to Fahrenheit and the output label. So it's, it's, the output label is the units basically. 
So the output label is F for Fahrenheit here, and then the other one, it's C for Celsius. Um, the function is about as simple as it can be. The actual maths is just the, the conversion. Um, this thing here in triple quoted brackets, in triple quoted quotes, this is the, uh, the help, this is the comment string, and this is what you would see if you typed help. If you call the help function on Celsius to Fahrenheit when you were running GluVis in the, in, if you're working in the terminal, you, it would print out this for you. So it's quite worthwhile to make this fairly descriptive. So what we've got to do is get this so that it's inside Gluvis when it starts up and it's called demo config. The first thing you have to do is save a copy, save it as, I'll save it directly as, and we need to go to your home directory and you need to go to uh, a, a directory called dot glue. So dot glue may not show up on, on um, some of your uh, file selectors and things because they're, they're set to ignore dot files, but you have to get into dot glue and you now save demo config simply as config. So now, in your Python, in your dot glue folder, in your home directory, uh, you've got this file called config, which contains these link functions. So now if I go back to the terminal, I'll run glue again from the terminal. I don't do anything other than just type glue. Okay, uh, you can see glue, um, do the import data. Again, so we've got two data sets, we can link them. Here in the link functions, we've got them, have we got them here in, in general? And yes, here in general, you've got Celsius to Fahrenheit and Fahrenheit to Celsius. So you can now link your data, convert in Celsius to Fahrenheit and Fahrenheit to Celsius. So you can link data that has different units. Um, now, this is the simplest I could give you, but potentially link functions could be very powerful. Um, you know, they could, they could access other data, other data sources. They could take a value that from one file, do something with that value, perhaps look it up in a database and then return the value from that. They can be very powerful, particularly I think if you were doing some heterogeneous, very heterogeneous data, shall we say, different population groups and things, it would, it would be, I suspect, more in the, the social sciences. It could be powerful where you're you're doing wildly different groups or connecting sociological data to economic data, stuff like that. You could do some very powerful things with link functions, um, but that's how you do link functions anyway. That's it from me. Does anybody have any questions? You, you select the two link functions. There's a little arrow. If you look in the, the editor thing, when it creates that link, there's a little arrow between them. And you would, you would set, you set one link function to go one way and the other link function to go the other way. You would link the one that's in Celsius to the one that's in Fahrenheit, go in Celsius to Fahrenheit, and you link the one that's in Fahrenheit to the one that's in Celsius using the link from Fahrenheit from Fahrenheit to Celsius. They, they have to. They basically have to have um, one input and one return because they're linking columns. Um, I'm not sure. One thing I've never found out is whether you could link multiple columns. So if you had again very heterogeneous data. Mm -hmm it might be possible to link two columns in one table to one column in another table. I'm not sure about that. Um, I've never tried it, so I, I wouldn't guarantee it's possible. But you've got to follow the format for the link function. 
-hmm. So I suspect it isn't because the format for the link function is one input, one output. And you've got to put that decorator on it to tell it that it is a link function. Yeah, the fits, W5 fits is, is, is actually a kind of image. It's an, it's an unusual image standard used in astronomy, but that was image data. That's why if you try dragging the W5 fits in and select table, it'll say it's the wrong sort of data to show in a table and it won't let you have a table. So yeah, you can incorporate JPEGs, PNGs, image files, but you, 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 you won't be able to show them in a table because for each, it's, an image is like a table, but it's got a red, a green, and a blue at, at each point instead of just a column. So it doesn't like that. Okay, well, we're coming to an end now. We've got, I think we've got two minutes left on this meeting. So um, it's been fun having you. Hopefully you've learned something, even if it's even if you're never going to use Gloovis, maybe you've learned something about Python. <laughs>